sheep ownership. Um, and I think what we've heard today already, obviously, but also you'll all know, um, community land ownership is now an accepted part of the political discussion in Scotland, and we often talk about it actually being mainstreamed. But often it's now seen, particularly in the public, the public sector, community ownership is an answer to some of the public sector's problems, particularly in terms of delivering services um, or retaining facilities. Um, but often we're finding that the case for community ownership is a moral or ethical or woolly sort of community sort of thing that's a really nice thing to do, but actually we're all finding it quite difficult to articulate the economic case. Um, and this conference this year, we've talked about this quite a bit, that actually we want to start building that economic case, we want to be able to articulate that economic case really strongly, both in sort of quantitative terms, um, in terms of numbers of jobs or GBA, um, but also in those broader qualitative terms that economics, that economists love. Um, so if we're talking about making a substantial contribution to the well-being economy um, and to delivering on community wealth building, what's that actually going to look like on the ground? What does that actually mean to people? Because we're all really good at using these phrases, but what, what does it mean? What, what are you doing in your everyday work, in the community, in the supporting communities, that actually contributes to economic value? Um, so that's really the purpose of the discussion today. Um, and that can be around things like numbers of jobs, or numbers of businesses that you've helped to um, uh, set up or business space you've provided that supports businesses. So if any of you have ever done funding applications, and I can imagine most of you have, um, it's those sorts of things that you put in a funding application saying, well, you know, we've levered in X hundred thousand pounds um, into our community, we've created this many jobs, um, we've supported so many small businesses, we've built these houses, we've increased the school role by this. It's those sorts of things, um, and how can we better articulate that really broad impact that community ownership and community-led activity is having on the Scottish economy. So we have done some scoping work on this before, um, where we did actually um, provide some really detailed figures. Um, so unfortunately, this is 10 years old now, um, 2014, um, but the study in 2014 we looked at 12 projects, um, found that over in, that, in 2014, so 10 years ago, over 34 million pounds had been invested directly by the community landowners. 53% um, of that was the community landowners' own funds from um, income they generated themselves. The largest areas um, of investment were in renewable energy, housing and communications infrastructure, transport infrastructure, including piers, roads and broadband. So already 10 years ago, we were in the heart of actually making these places work and it wasn't just about delivering the community centre, as important as that is, or supporting green space. We were actually getting seriously involved in some of the major infrastructure in these communities. All 12 of those estates have delivered an increase in capital value from 17 million to 59 million. About 10 years on, imagine what they're worth now, a huge amount, and a large part of that is due to the work of community landowners improving those assets. And annually, the organisations contributed to local employment and the local economy with over two and a half million pounds spent on staff and local contractors, and direct staffing increased from pre-acquisition to post-acquisition by 368%. So again, a lot of you will know that when you acquire assets, you need people to run them, you employ them, you pay a fair wage, they've got good jobs, um, all the things that weren't happening before. So it's thinking in those really broad terms about what you're doing in your community to contribute to local economic development. So we're going to use the outcome of the discussions today, um, and we've put paper on your tables for you to jot down, have a discussion, jot down anything that you think might be relevant. Um, as I say, I've, I've given you some examples, but you all have other examples as well, and which we'll build, um, we'll use together to build that robust economic argument as to why community ownership needs to be a part of a wellbeing economy in Scotland. And um, we'll also use it to help form the declaration that we want to produce at the end of the conference. So we want you to talk about your own experience, whether you've been involved in a community and land ownership project, or if you're an intermediate organisation, and um, how you've supported that. Um, to help us build a body of evidence. So, so we've done some Mentimeter surveys already, Lindsay and Josh talked about them, but um, we've, we've specifically looked at community wealth building. Um, so I'll let Josh just run through a few of those, again, just to sort of inspire you, hopefully, as to things that you might want to think about, um, and then I'll just talk through the timings. Thanks, Thanks Elsa. So yeah, I'm just going to run through some of the Mentimeter results as a way of kind of getting you all thinking, and then we'll, we'll split you up into your tables and provide some provocation so you can do a bit of kind of group work together before we come back for a, 
for a bigger kind of group discussion, as Elsa says, to try and start thinking about the evidence that you've got from your own context, helping us to start to formulate both the declaration, but also some future research we're going to do to kind of take these examples to government um, as a means of building the case for further support for community ownership. So in terms of the Mentimeter results, so one of the, one of the provocations we have made was, what does the idea of community wealth building mean to you? And I've just picked out a few to get us started. So someone said, communities having control of assets so as to generate income and provide space to build community resilience. It's about generating diverse community controlled income streams. Someone else said it's about developing local economies, sustainable models of sharing wealth, skills and support in smaller communities, working with and supporting existing communities, people, organisations and infrastructure. It's local resources benefiting local people. Resources are not extracted from an area to benefit people or a company who live elsewhere. Community wealth building means creating income in the local area and keeping it in the local area. Building things that are valuable but may not have a price. And this is something that I want us to think about. That's a really important one to think quite holistically, quite expansively about what we mean by wealth. We're not just talking about finance here. Using land and ownership models to, to catalyze more localization of the economy. I really like that phrase, localization of the economy. Money spent within a community by the community. Wealth leveraged to create more opportunity. Providing access to resources that allow more control for local communities. Enabling them to ensure local development is targeted appropriately and undertaken responsibly. And then the other pro provocation to help feed into this workshop was, can you give examples of how you are building wealth in your community? And so someone said, taking on control of land and buildings to provide opportunities for community to grow food, learn new skills, and pay back to the wider community with their time, skills, and knowledge. Others said they were building sustainable pathway infrastructure, improving biodiversity and aiding flood prevention, bringing disused buildings back into the community ownership for redevelopment. Community owned energy being fully invested back into the community. Creating jobs, providing volunteering and vocational training opportunities, running local markets, supporting local businesses. Providing unique and affordable facilities to hire and use, selling local produce, training up local people, creating a democratic experience. Another person said we've bought land for the community asset transfer and are trying to build affordable homes and woodland crops to help with the housing situation. We're setting up a tourism business in our forest. We're investing in local businesses at every opportunity, the totally, totally local economy campaign, creating local employment and job opportunities and improving living conditions. And again, energy. We have a wind turbine which runs a generous community grant scheme. It employs staff and has led to fun large scale projects. And then someone else said a community steering group meetings for roundtable discussions. And I, I, I included this one because that's what I want us to think about wealth a bit more expansively. This isn't just about finance, this isn't just about big capital projects, this is about capacity building as well. As, as some of us said over, said over dinner last night, Rachel, one of our new board members, pointed out we should really be thinking about resource, not just thinking about finance or capital, we're just thinking about people as well as money. So when you split into your, well, you already split into groups, which is very helpful. So when you're sitting in your groups, these are the kind of things that I want us to think about. And we've got three provocations here. So what does community-led economic development or community wealth building, and you have a discussion about whether you want to talk about economic development or community wealth building, look like in your area? What has been the most impactful economic outcome of community ownership in your area? And if you don't live somewhere where there is community land ownership, what do you think that would be? And what are the best metrics for measuring community and economic development in your area? And so for this question, like Elsa was saying, so we're going to do some work around thinking through the traditional kind of metrics for economic development. You know, the chief, the chief economist in government can kind of understand, but we think those metrics don't always necessarily work for what we're trying to explain in terms of thinking of wealth holistically. So what are the other metrics that you think would be useful that we can start talking in those kind of terms, as well as the more traditional ones? So before we split off into groups, um, if you're sitting on a table with people that you arrived with, and you're from, particularly if you're from a community landowner organisation, can you move tables so that we split up people who have direct experience with this with people who may be bringing different kind of experiences? So if you're sitting with somebody who you came with from a community land trust or other community land ownership organisation, can you please move to another table? Yeah, anything else, Elsie? No, 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 We've got 20, 20 minutes, so we're coming back together for a group discussion at just after quarter past quarter to three. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs> <laughs>
the spot. Um, ideally, with people you don't know, that would be even better. But if you do know them, that's fine too. Um, and if we can just get sort of probably about six to eight people on each table, because um, we're trying to have a, um, a discussion on the individual table.
direct staffing increased from pre-acquisition to post-acquisition by 368%. So again, a lot of you will know that when you acquire assets, you need people to run them, you employ them, you pay a fair wage, they've got good jobs, um, all the things that weren't happening before. So it's thinking in those really broad terms about what you're doing in your community to contribute to local economic development. So we're going to use the outcome of the discussions today um, and we've put paper on your tables for you to jot down, have a discussion, jot down anything that you think might be relevant. Um, as I say, I've, I've given you some examples, but you all have other examples as well, and which we'll build, um, we'll use together to build that robust economic argument as to why community ownership needs to be a part of a wellbeing economy in Scotland. And we'll also use it to help form the declaration that we want to produce at the end of the conference. So we want you to talk about your own experience, whether you've been involved in a community and land ownership project or if you're an intermediate organisation, um, how you've supported that um, to help us build the body of evidence. So, so we've done some Mentimeter surveys already, you didn't see Josh talked about them, but um, we've we specifically looked at community wealth building. Um, so I'll let Josh just run through a few of those, again, just to sort of inspire you hopefully as to things that you might want to think about, um, and then I'll just talk through the timings. Thanks, Elsa. So yeah, I'm just going to run through some of the Mentimeter results as a way of kind of getting you your thinking, and then we'll, we'll split you up into your tables and provide some provocations so you can do a bit of kind of group work together before we come back for a, for a bigger kind of group discussion. As Elsa says, to try and start thinking about the evidence that you've got from your own context, helping us to start to form formulate both the declaration, but also some future research we're going to do to kind of take these examples to government um, as a means of building the case for further support community ownership. So in terms of the Mentimeter results, so one of the, one of the provocations we have in there was what does the idea of community wealth building mean to you? And I've just picked out a few to get us started. So someone said communities having control of assets so as to generate income and provide space to build community resilience. It's about generating diverse community controlled income streams. Someone else said it's about developing local economies, sustainable models of sharing wealth, skills and support in smaller communities working with and supporting existing communities, people, organisations and infrastructure. It's local resources benefiting local people. Resources are not extracted from an area to benefit people or a company who live elsewhere. Community wealth building means creating income in the local area and keeping it in the local area. Building things that are valuable but may not have a price. And this is something that I want us to think about. That's a really important one to think quite holistically, quite expansively about what we mean by wealth. We're not just talking about finance here. Using land and ownership models to, to catalyze more localization of the economy. I really like that phrase, localization of the economy. Money spent within a community by the community. Wealth leveraged to create more opportunity. Providing access to resources that allow more control for local communities. Enabling them to ensure local development is targeted appropriately and undertaken responsibly. And then the other pro provocation to help feed into this workshop was, can you give examples of how you are building wealth in your community? And so someone said, taking on control of land and buildings to provide opportunities for community to grow food, learn new skills, and pay back to the wider community with their time, skills, and knowledge. Others said they were building sustainable pathway infrastructure, improving biodiversity, enabling flood prevention, bringing disused buildings back into the community ownership for redevelopment. Community owned energy being fully invested back into the community. Creating jobs, providing voluntary and vocational training opportunities, running local markets, supporting local businesses. Providing you can afford unique and affordable facilities to hire and use, selling local produce, training up local people, creating a democratic experience. Another person said we've bought land for the community asset transfer and are trying to build affordable homes and woodland crops to help with the housing situation. We're setting up a tourism business in our forest. We're investing in local businesses at every opportunity, the totally, totally local economy campaign, creating local employment and job opportunities and improving living conditions. And again, energy, we have a wind turbine which runs a generous community grant scheme. It employs staff and has led to fun large-scale projects. And then someone else said a community steering group meetings for roundtable discussions. And I, I, I included this one because that's what I want us to think about wealth a bit more expansively. This isn't just about finance, this isn't just about big capital projects, this is about capacity building as well. As, as some of us said over, said over dinner last night, Rachel, one of our new board members, pointed out we should really be thinking about resource, not just thinking about finance or capital, we're just thinking about people as well as money. So when you split into your, well you're already split into groups which is very helpful, so when you're sitting in your groups, these are the kind of things that I want us to think about. 
And we've got three provocations here. So what does community-led economic development or community wealth building, and you have a discussion about whether you want to talk about economic development or community wealth building, look like in your area? What has been the most impactful economic outcome of community ownership in your area? And if you don't live somewhere where there is community land ownership, what do you think that would be? And what are the best metrics for measuring community and economic development in your area? And so for this question, like Elsa was saying, so we're going to do some work around thinking through the traditional kind of metrics for economic development, you know, the chief, the chief economist in government can kind of understand, but we think those metrics don't always necessarily work for what we're trying to explain in terms of thinking of wealth holistically. So what are the other metrics that you think would be useful that we can start talking in those kind of terms, as well as the more traditional ones? So before we split off into groups, um, if you're sitting on a table with people that you arrived with, and you're from, particularly if you're from a community and an organisation, can you move tables so that we split up people who have direct experience with this with people who may be bringing different kind of experiences? So if you're sitting with somebody who came with from a community land trust or other community land ownership organisation, can you please move to another table? Is there anything else, Elsie? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, we've got, we've got 20, 20 minutes, so we'll come back together for a group discussion at just after quarter past quarter to three. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs> That came up, yeah, the, the opportunities afforded to us, but also the threats of, of forestry and the natural capital side of things. Um, and then we agreed for number three that the current metrics don't work, but we weren't brave enough to really put forward anything that we thought could work. But I think there, there are indications, if you like, around the table, maybe things that could emerge, um, like the capacity, uh, measures of increased capacity, and confidence. Um, and one for me is really hope. So they might sort of be gross domestic happiness. Yeah. How happy are you to yeah. stay in your community? Yeah. Okay, no, brilliant, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, we were talking about many aspects altogether, but I tried to gather them up into the questions. So one, we talked about what does community led economic development look like, and your example was around collaboration and coordination a stronger identity um, and reach and that base from working from. The collective responsibility and opportunity that is in that is really important. Um, equality and on access or equal access we hope to territorial resources for now but also very importantly to safeguard for the future. We talked about the pillars of community wealth building a little bit and I thought it was really interesting that there's a sort of discomfort or perhaps a question around it being seen as a thing rather than as a process and community wealth building is a journey, is a continuum. We need to see it as a process that will realise and release community wealth across manifold or multifaceted opportunities. So it's a sort of pipeline towards community led economic development. We can't see it as a thing, as a finite thing. We've got to realise that's many many things that need to come together. It exists where there's a gap, you talked about the gap um, it fills a gap where it's not being met, perhaps by statutory uh, public or private sector activity. Um, what it produces, uh, or the impactful outcomes, increased trust and understanding. And you were talking about Cameron, the the, the two-way dialogue that we need to increase understanding that that third sector can indeed deliver. So it's a confidence of the externals as well as within the community to see actually so much more and that leads to increased capacity and resource to deliver value for the community so in terms of the economic um, impact it's a more productive and more resourced place which leads to efficiencies as well as being in a position to act on opportunities when they come in the short mid or the longer term metrics and um, the need for a lexicon or language 
language that is both accessible and comes from the community, but is one that the private investors, those who we want to see as perhaps greater partners, um, it resonates, it breeds confidence, and they don't just see the community as this uninformed entity. Um, to extend the added value and um, the great impacts that community-led economic development, we need metrics that um, are more holistic and are indicators, I think, that, that else, as you said, that reflect what the community most value. So we started to talk a little bit about place-based metrics. How do you toggle that and make it work at a national, international, but also be firmly owned and the metrics, the values, the returns that are most important to that community. So how do you achieve that? Brilliant, thanks Rachel. Someone that actually answered the homework question set. <laughs> supposed to answer their own questions. Marvellous. I think that whole point about addressing private and public market failure is absolutely critical. Um, and that's what we need to be focusing on. That the market is just not working in so many of these spaces, which is why communities are intervening. Um, thanks. Who's, who's taking the next table? Oh, thanks Megan. Um, thanks, Elsa. I think we kind of sort of looked at the questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we spent quite a lot of time talking about the different things that our groups are doing to deliver economic benefit, both through <coughs> generating income as well as providing basic public services. And then we spent a bit of time also talking about metrics that are the most obvious ones that you can account for capital value changes that that's, it doesn't necessarily, that, that's sometimes externally driven, mm -hmm. um, members of staff, multiplier effect of grant income, what you can do with the grants in terms of generating other activities, school role and things like that. But then we spent most of the time talking about the, the challenges really of attribution. When you are a community <coughs> land owner or a community development trust, you are enabling other businesses to be set up, you are enabling other people to retain and have jobs from providing them with broadband. How, when you're thinking about measuring the impact, where do you draw the line? Where is it fair to be claiming the impact as an attribution that you can directly claim from? Or where are you, you know, at what point does it become disingenuous um, that someone else has done, particularly when you have different groups working in the same area where you have a community land owner and another group sets up a shop. And, and just being really fair, really, in terms of reflecting that impact. Um, does anyone else want to add anything? Okay, that's, no, that's great, it. thanks. And I think there are mechanisms, aren't there? Because the development agencies are able to do that and understand what attribution it is. So it's got some lessons to be learned there. So a lot of the economic benefit being really about the loss of potential in a way, and how can that be measured? Um, I think we wrote down um, something about how can you calculate the lost income of Highland businesses that have staffing issues. So there was a discussion about how a lot of businesses are kind of going down to three days a week or two days a week purely because of staffing issues. How can that lost income be calculated on mass, and how would that potentially inform um, CLS's kind of campaigning, I think that'd be good. Um, <clears throat> but we also talked a little bit about how there's this disconnect between younger working age people sort of often not being able to afford to buy, living in urban places, living in the central belt, communities up here saying they really want young people. Young people sitting around having discussions about how they don't have no connection to land and want it, want to build a, their own home, want a tiny home. Why is there sort of what's this? There's a huge strategic opportunity there that's like not being leveraged very well, and maybe there's like something to be done on a bigger scale to think about how those could be marketed or incentivized better, and um, so that those young people can start to think of themselves as part of like Scotland's land more broadly. Um, and um, we were talking about how some of the metrics of um, Wealth could be about uh, school role increases in areas, but 
Um, somebody put down here a nice phrase, which was that um, you can see wealth as metrics as a barometer of community health as well. So that kind of peels into that idea of localised yeah. metrics of wealth, which I think is really interesting. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So that, that's great. That whole idea of how you bring young people um, to areas is really important. And actually, MICT have done, I think, Sandy, I'm right in saying, haven't they, that MICT have done that piece of work and more, haven't they, about what the lost potential GVA is if you built more houses. Um, so that, that, that is available. Someone's got to stand up. Yeah. Tempted to produce a visual aid as to what we have written down. <laughs> um, I think we did address the first two questions, at least in part. We didn't address the third one at all. Uh, community led economic development within each of our areas of the south of Scotland and Highland representation on the, on the table um, was about the difficulties, uh, the openness to uh, shared initiatives, to co investment particularly in renewables, um, the possibilities of making that work, the difficulties of the fact that that is rarely offered uh, by developers. We focused a lot on renewables and how that worked and what we could make it, and also forestry and woodland ownership and how they could be useful assets, so sometimes they are wasting assets um, and assets that will increase in value, but actually are not assets that can be used to generate uh, income for the area. And I think the question for ourselves would also be, in each of those areas, have we the skills to negotiate uh, shared ventures of any description? And the answer was probably not. Nor did were we entirely confident that we could draw on those skills and that support from elsewhere. So whilst there would be a commitment to uh, shared investment in renewables, shared investment possibly in other areas, there would be considerable difficulties in making that real and we needed a, a, a support infrastructure, so to do. Is that fair? Yeah, no thanks Michael for points. Should we back with one? Hi, my name is Joe from Inspiralba. Um, so, we largely heard from Mary on our project from Lana. Um, and I think, in terms of the first question, what does community-led economic development look like in your area was mainly about making use of the better use of the land for the community, which actually had been a liability for the, the landowner potentially. I think on that note though, um, it's how do you make sure it's not a liability for the community organisation as well. Um, and in terms of the impact, I mean certainly with this project there was job creation, um, also Housing as well, housing, staff housing. So the one that been <coughs> the up on though was that although there was jobs being created, a lot of the time these jobs are grant funded, therefore not funded through the enterprise that's been created within the land. And how sustainable is that? And how, although these you know, really good sort of economic benefits are coming through is how fragile they are um, and that, you know, how do we address that and how do we make sure that they're sustainable um, for the long term. Um, I think that was sort of really the key thing, especially now in the current climate where grant funding is becoming less. So how do we make sure these impacts are there for the long term? Great, thanks very much. Table. We spend a lot of time discussing who was going to get the mic. A bit like on the job at tables, we didn't answer the questions either. We went back to, um, to the first principles of what is economic production um, and acknowledging that it's land, labour, and capital, if I remember, uh, universally the case that far back. Um, but acknowledging that uh, the national economic framework, the national economic development doesn't really mention land very much. It tends more to mention what land uses and what land production might uh, create. Um, but we, from our experience around the table, obviously know that community ownership have different aspirations for outcomes than a private owners might have. And, um, that that would uh, lead to completely different types 
some examples. So what, what, would, how would you measure community ownership outputs? Have you identified those direct jobs, which are basically ones that the owner uh, controls, but the important aspect of facilitating the other businesses and other economic activities that happen um, is vital. And just from very recent experience we had, we reckon on a small island or an egg, there were probably at least 10 businesses, that, private businesses that we created because the community owned the factory production. <laughs> and if the else say that, there's a follow up. Well, it was really in the question that John first raised about, um, John's summary was very erudite, but this is far better than the discussion. Uh, that, um, the, 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 the first point he was making about economic policy overall, yeah, I do find it interesting that when you talk of, when there's a national debate about economic policy, as demonstrated in all the economic strategies that you've had from successive governments since evolution, virtually nowhere does land feature, and wherever it does feature, it features as a question of land use, not a question of land ownership. And therefore, national economic debate that only concentrates on land use fails to ask a fundamental economic question, which is where does the land ownership reside? Because that's what huge implications for the concentration or the distribution of wealth, how wealth flows through our society, and so on. So that's the thing that, that all seems to address, as well as providing evidence of um, the community ownership case, if you like, in all of the questions that you're asking. There's a much more fundamental question of why is the national debate only about a land use question and not a land ownership question. And that, to me, is something that Theresa May has talked about others ought to also try and get onto the national agenda. Yeah, that's a really good point to finish on, um, Peter. And, and we'll, we'll take away all the points from today, and this will be a theme that we keep coming back to members on um, about how do we develop this set of metrics to persuade funders and um, Scottish Government um, that actually community ownership does have that economic potential to transform the economy in a way that lots of politicians say they want it to change. Um, and actually, community ownership could really be at the core of that. So, thanks very much for all your brain power today. It was really good for you to spend the time on it. Um, we're now off for teas and cakes and things, and we should be back at half past three. Um, who's in here, Meg? Uh, so, this room will have the gentrification workshop, so it's about resisting gentrification. The conversation about updates on the land reform bill will take place in the space. And if you're going for the small scale biodiversity workshop, that will be downstairs in the cafe area, which is where you're headed right now for tea and coffee. So you have extra time for tea and coffee. Thanks. Thank you.